Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started today. I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, as part of really our, our first uh, webinar on publishing in the ASAB journals. Uh, my name is Gary Fox. I have the privilege of serving as the editor-in-chief of the journals. Um, and we want to take you through a little bit on uh, kind of navigating the publication process specifically for our journals. Of, um, this is a lecture or presentation that I've given a number of different times, primarily in um, some uh, introductory graduate level courses on research methods, but I'm going to expand it out a little bit so that um, I hope to hit something of interest to um, I know a lot of different members of the audience today. I know we've got uh, people that are joining us on the webinar that uh, will be a little bit more advanced in their publishing and then also some people that may be uh, newcomers to the publishing field. Um, what we'll do is, is I'll try to pause at several different places and maybe see if there are questions or anything. Uh, hopefully you've got your mic muted unless you need to ask a question and I've got I think everybody with uh, access now to be able to, to ask a question. So if you do have a question, uh, just make sure you unmute uh, and then you can, you can ask the question. But we'll try to stop in a couple of different places uh, as we go through the webinar today and we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so we're gonna jump right in. And so our um, kind of our first uh, information that I wanna pass on is that this webinar is really based on what I really think is a really uh, fantastic resource that was developed and written uh, by myself and a number of the community editors in ASAB um, on specifically talking about navigating the publication process. And this is an article that just came out this past year. Uh, and so there's the citation to the article. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that that's an open access article uh, that you can get access to uh, and a lot of the information that we're going to talk about in the webinar today, at least most of it is part of, uh, of that publication. And so if you want us some follow-up information, I, I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that, at that publication for sure. Uh, the other thing I would wanted to do was to kind of start before we talk about how to navigate the process is actually talk a little bit about uh, the ASAB journals in general and about some of the things that you should consider as you start thinking about uh, where to publish articles and what types of articles that you can publish. Uh, the first thing there is shown on the screen is that uh, there are actually now five different article types uh, that the ASAB journals will publish, whether that's transactions or uh, applied engineering and ag or the Journal of Ag Safety and Health. Uh, of course, we've got the normal research articles. Uh, and again, those word limit page limits are not, are not hard. Those are just general guidelines. Uh, we have something now referred to as research briefs or technical notes. Those have been published in the past before. Uh, but you may also want to consider publishing things like a review article or a frontier article or a perspectives article. So a review article would be something where you, you know, synthesize, look at the literature that's been published on a topic that's of interest to the society, and you kind of provide um, kind of what is the state of the science or what is the state of the engineering with regard to that topic. Um, a frontier article is an article where you might present what is or where is the cutting edge of engineering science or educational research. Um, I like to think about frontier articles as kind of opportunities when um, you might be giving an invited talk or an invited presentation. Maybe it's at the annual international meeting of ASAB. And the frontier article would be a way that if you then followed that presentation up with a short publication, you could follow it up as a frontier article, which would kind of, again, talk about what your vision is of that cutting edge engineering science or education. Uh, these tend to be much shorter articles, but it's a way to capture that information that you might be, might be giving in an invited presentation. Uh, that's a way to capture it and then to have that be much, much more uh, lasting uh, in terms of putting that into the literature. Uh, and then a perspectives article is also a new article type that uh, uh, the ACB journals are looking at publishing. Uh, I like to think about perspectives articles as really a kind of either a, a kind of a smaller review article uh, where you're talking about some kind of a viewpoint or a discussion uh, that interfaces with a lot of the topics in our discipline. Uh, or what we're actually probably seeing a lot of is perspectives articles that are coming out that are really focused on uh, synthesizing or interpreting the results of a workshop or a conference or a symposium. Uh, and so uh, we recently had 
a, a workshop that was focused on um, measuring soil erodibility. We had about 25 individuals that were uh, that participated in that workshop, uh, and the, the discussion was to, to actually develop a perspectives article that talks about what were the key findings, what were the key take-home messages from that workshop. Again, as a way to almost uh, convey the information that was in that workshop on a, on a short time scale to a much longer time scale through uh, the ASAB journals. So first and foremost, I would encourage you to think about, as you're thinking about publications and those type of things, think about the fact that there are a multiple, there are multiple types of articles that you can, you can publish. Uh, of course, we all are very interested in metrics and uh, how those compare uh, for uh, the ASAB journals. Here's a table that I commonly show that talks about and that shows the impact factors and the five-year impact factors of the journals. Um, I think one of the very important things to communicate about these metrics is uh, for the ASAB journals, for example, in particular, uh, ASAB journals, they, we do not have the impact factor that we want to have at this point. We're making some progress on, on trying to definitely improve those metrics. Uh, but articles in our discipline are not going to be the types of articles that are going to get uh, a lot of citations in a short time period. So for example, if you look at the actual calculation of the impact factor, probably a lot of people don't realize that that impact factor is actually calculated over simply a, almost a, a two year time window. Uh, and so impact factor, uh, I'm gonna show and talk to you about in a minute, uh, is, is important because actually a lot of people use it as a way to predict the future citation potential of an article, but it may not be the most important. Um, in fact, the uh, developer of the impact factor actually talks about that in many disciplines, there are other metrics that are probably more important to talk about. Some of those include this, this one that's referred to as a cited half-life. Uh, and for example, for transactions of ASAB, the cited, cited half-life is about 14.4 years. That's basically how long do you have to go to get to half of the citations to an article. So the larger that cited half-life is, basically it means that the articles are getting cited over a longer period of time. And those articles are making a contribution to the, to the science and in, in the engineering over a long period of time. Uh, across all of our journals, the median review time is about 64 days. Uh, somewhere between 60, 64 to 70 days is uh, really the target median review time for the journals. And that's actually inc increased significantly over the past um, three, four, five years. And so um, while the review times are maybe not as good as some of the other journals, I think once you balance that with uh, the, the review process and the, the fact that you are being reviewed by peers in your discipline, uh, the medium review time there is, is, very, is a very appropriate value. Uh, and then I'll also point out that there are brand new journal websites that you can go to that have a lot more information and really make it a lot easier for you to get access to the papers that have been published uh, in the journal. But I'd just like to kind of go through and talk a little bit about a little bit about those metrics. And we'll talk about in just a minute, we'll talk about the fact that there are lots of different reasons potentially to publish in a journal and, and guide you through that. Um, I'll show you a little bit of, of interesting data that I actually have just gotten through pulling off uh, and then putting together. And it really looks at how important is this journal impact factor concept. Um, there are actually more and more calls today uh, more and more uh, people that are actually suggesting that we should move away from the use of the journal impact factor. Um, what we see as a, a, a you know, personal, uh, my personal situation here, what I see is that upper administrators like to use journal impact factor because it's really an easy way to potentially predict the future citation potential to an article and therefore the assumed impact of that article. Uh, and so I started getting very interested in, in um, you know, what's the relationship between the journal impact factor and the actual number of citations that a paper receives? And so what I did is looked at the publication profiles for five extensively published authors uh, in BAE programs or, or, or graduates of BAE programs, people that publish in the ASAB journals. Uh, and I looked at the simply just looked at their Google Scholar profiles. Uh, in order to kind of homogenize the group of, of authors I was looking at, I looked at recent and core soil and water engineering awardees. So these are authors that have published a lot of articles that have been very successful in, in publishing. And they're labeled down here in this table as A1 through A5. And you can kind of see some of the metrics on them. Um, they're actually quite uh, extensively published authors. 
uh, that publish in a lot of different journals with a lot of different impact factors, but have also published a lot in the ASAB journals, uh, in both transactions of ASAB and applied engineering and ag. Uh, this is just a box plot showing kind of the uh, current impact factors of those five authors, and then if I lump all the authors together. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to say, well, what is that relationship, and is there a relationship between journal impact factor and the number of citations that a paper gets? And so I started looking at some of this relationship, and what you can see here is on the x-axis is actually the journal impact factor of all of those articles, and then on the y-axis on this graph on the left is citations per year to an article. And again, the hypothesis was is if I publish in a higher impact factor journal, I should get more citations per year to my articles. Uh, but one of the things to note here is that this is a correlation coefficient. There was actually an insignificant correlation coefficient and very, very low correlation. In fact, one of the papers is actually not shown in this graph that had 505 citations per year. And if you had to guess, I could probably, you know, I could ask everybody on this call, which, what do you think the impact factor of the, of the journal was that had 505 citations per year? Um, and it just so happened that this was a transactions of ASAB paper. So with a one, basically an impact factor of around 1.15, it would be somewhere uh, way up here. And so again, no correlation there between the impact factor and the number of citations per year to an article. If you look at impact factor versus the number of citations in the first two years following publication, again, a little bit more of a relationship. It is, some, it is statistically significant, but still a lot of scatter in that relationship. In fact, when you start looking at this, the only significant correlation that you actually start seeing is that there's a correlation between the number of citations in the first two years, and then also the total of citations to an, off, to the, to an article. So on the x-axis in this slide is the number of citations in the first two years following publication, and then the citations per year uh, to an article. And this is actually plotted out, actually separated this out so you could see all five of the authors that were analyzed. Uh, and again, there's a couple of papers on here that were not showing just because they had such high number of citations per year. In fact, both of those articles were in ASAB publications. Um, but what you can see, it's a pretty consistent relationship between those. Uh, and so the take home message is that as we started to look at this is that I am and, and the, the kind of message that I'm sharing with a lot of people is that um, it's more important that you submit manuscripts to journals where you know people are going to read those articles and that they're going to cite those articles in the first two years after publication. Because the articles that get cited in the first two years are more likely to then be cited additionally. And it makes sense, right? Once you start the citation ball rolling down the hill, it's easier to get more and more citations. Uh, and so one of, that's one of the things that we've, I've been sharing with uh, students here at NC State, or I did a seminar just recently at Virginia Tech, and I've been sharing a lot of this information uh, with them as well. Um, let me go to the next slide here, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of get into more of this a little bit about how now to navigate the publication process. And one of the things that I, I always like to emphasize at this part of, uh, of this process is that you really, as you submit an article for publication, the peer review process is really should be aimed at improving your contribution. Um, it's not about, you know, and I tell students this all the time, it's not about trying to get your article and get it published and go through the easiest path and the path of least resistance. It needs to be about how do you improve your contribution to make sure that your work is the strongest that it can possibly be uh, at that time of publication. And so my suggestion is, is to make sure you submit to a reasonable journal so that your work is going to be read and cited. Uh, and I, have, I tell people over and over again, is that always the ASAB journals? Well, absolutely not. It could be a different journal. Although we believe that if, if this is your main discipline and one of your primary disciplines and primary societies, um, that, it, that ASAB Journal should be an outlet for, for your work. Um, the other thing I like to mention is that persistent and improvement are keys, that good papers uh, will eventually get published. Um, I think I've had a, a number of cases where uh, I've had really good papers that have been rejected, even rejected outright as in from an editorial board without even going into review, uh, that you could then turn around and submit to another journal that is you know, maybe potentially as, uh, as high of an impact factor and so an assumed 
um, you know, as good of a journal. Uh, and that article's been published right away. And so I think that's the key is you've got to you've got to be persistent and, and dedicated to the improvement uh, of that work. Uh, and I think one of the things that I would say is is that um, you know I always keep in mind that every step of this process is about improving my contribution. So as I get reviews back, and one of the reviewers maybe maybe they're off base and they wrote stuff that doesn't even make sense. Well, that's a message to me that my, maybe I didn't do a good enough job in terms of making the research clear enough for that for that reviewer. Uh, and so I always emphasize, I always make sure that we talk about this is about improving the contribution of your work. Um, and as a department head, the last thing I would I would say is is I like seeing faculty publish in multiple journals uh, and also supporting their professional societies. That's one of the things that's important to me. Uh, and I think most of the department heads across the country, if you're in a faculty position, uh, they would probably also tell you uh, the same thing. So with all of that and all of that kind of background, so, so where do you publish, right? And I, as students or anything like this start asking me about this, I say, well, there's, there's definitely lots of journals to submit your work to, um, but there's things to consider. One of those things is readership or journal coverage, right? And we already saw some graphs previously that suggested that citations in the first two years are very important. You want to make sure that you submit an article to a journal where you know people are going to read and use that work. Um, impact factor. Uh, so we just saw that impact factor had very little correlations, but I still put it as something that's important to consider because again, I think at every point of the way, whether you're in academia or you're in government, um, I don't know as much on the industry side, but I think impact factor is going to be one of those metrics that's used uh, to evaluate the potential impact uh, of a research article, whether that's appropriate or not, uh, the bottom line is, is it, it is still used. Uh, in some institutions, it's used way more than in, in others. The third thing I would consider is review time, right? Um, as we, uh, the new kind of age of publishing is that, you know, in previous, you know, two decades ago, you could submit an article and it could stay in review for a year and, and probably wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, nowadays, it you know people want uh, responses back quicker, uh, and the publication just the the the, the procedure has changed. Uh, we're much more efficient now. Instead of submitting paper copies of everything and sending them off, we can do everything electronically. And so review time is also very important. Uh, and then also you need to consider page charges and the article page charges in a journal. Uh, and so as you kind of think about some of those things. Uh, I try to clump, I try to kind of group all of those, those four things together. Uh, and so with all of that, I would say, you know, we definitely want you to consider uh, the ASAB journals definitely as, a, as an avenue uh, for, for at least some of your research. Uh, and again, um, the way that I have advised uh, and mentored uh, colleagues and students is that Maybe ASAB journals aren't the right avenue or the right journal to reach your targeted audience for all of your work, uh, but we would hope that, that it would be uh, there for, for a lot of your work. Uh, and so we do have a submit one initiative that's underway that we'd like to see everybody kind of submit one paper to the ASAB journals um, so that we can kind of go through and, and again, kind of help build um, the, the strength of the papers that are being published in our journals now. So I'm going to stop there just for a minute because we're going to go into kind of we're going to transition now into kind of more of a, a kind of navigating specifically the publication process. And I didn't know if there was any questions that anybody wanted to ask at this time. Um, so I'll pause and see if anybody has a question or a comment. Okay, and hopefully everybody's got is able to do that. I think I've got everybody where they are on. They're able to uh, submit a question or a comment. So I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep moving then. Uh, and so one of the things that the paper that we published recently uh, that talks about navigating the publication process. One of the things that it talks about in that paper. Uh, there's actually a very very good table. I would refer you to table two. Uh, in that article talks about and summarizes common mistakes. Uh, and so what I did is I really kind of surveyed all of the community editors and said, what do you see as common mistakes in articles that lead to articles 
not going through as smoothly in the review process. Uh, and so I'll, I'll take you through uh, some of those common mistakes. Uh, first and foremost is errors in grammar and English. Um, I think, at least for me as a reviewer, if I can't, if, I, if there are a lot of grammar mistakes and English mistakes in the, in the writing, I actually can't get past that point to actually think about the science and the engineering. And so it really, really, you really need to spend a lot of time working on the writing. Uh, and, you know, as engineers, we, in technical writing, we love to write, you know, as succinctly as possible. And so a lot of times I will actually have, you know, my students and my postdocs actually go back through uh, and try to remove all the extra words that they don't really need in their writing. And what I intend to find is that that tends to improve the writing significantly. I think some of the best abstracts I've ever written are abstracts where when I started writing, you know, I didn't worry about a word count. And then I got to the point and I looked up and they were like, oh, this is limited to 250 words. And I had to cut words as much as possible to get to 250. Well, by the time I got to 250, the, the abstract sounded really good. And so I think we need to, we need to spend some time doing that. Uh, there are uh, English editing services that you can use if you need some assistance with that. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do is make sure that you're sharing uh, research articles with colleagues and getting, and getting their input. Uh, it always helps to have somebody read and, and look through the paper. Uh, again, it uh, really, really helps when you can understand the writing to understand what, what is in the science or the engineering. The next thing I would challenge you to do is really think about the keywords that you're using in your articles. Uh, a lot of people don't think about keywords. They, you see a lot of cases where keywords are simply words that are repeated from the title, uh, but keywords are used a lot in search engines and things like that. And so if you want to get more citations to your articles, you've got to get your article cited in the first two years. To get your article cited in the first two years, it's got to be found. And most people today, most, you know, most researchers are basically going on to Google, Google Scholar, uh, some kind of a database, maybe like Web of Science, and they're searching keywords. And so it's very important that you have keywords uh, that are going to help people find your articles. The next thing I would say is make sure your terminology is consistent. So terminology being inconsistent is really a problem. So if you're using a term or a phrase to mean something and you use that at the start of the paper, Use that consistently throughout the rest of the paper. As you start to mix terminology, right, it becomes very difficult to follow what people are, are talking about. So if you have, for example, you know, you're defining a variable or you're using a phrase to talk about a variable, use that phrase or use that abbreviation or that acronym for that variable throughout the rest of the text. Uh, the next thing that the editorial board or the members that wrote or you know, that were co-authors on the paper talked about was the fact that they really like to see an introduction that leads the reader to the problem or the objective. Uh, introductions do not have to be verbose, they do not have to be long, you do not have to summarize all of the research or all the literature that exists on a topic. What you really need to do is lead the reader so that by the end of the introduction, they already understand what your problem or your objective statement is gonna be. And they understand that because you've identified what those key questions are as you move through that process. So uh, I like to tell people when I work with them that the introduction should almost be kind of an upside down triangle. You need to start broad and then you need to focus it as you go down. And as you focus it and go down, that last statement needs to be kind of, this is the problem, this is the objective that I'm gonna address in specifically in this research. But again, the best introductions are where people, they know the objective statement that's coming because you've clearly laid that out. One of the things that I struggled with, especially early in my career, is that I tended to write objective statements that were way too broad and were not specific enough, right? So I tried to solve this huge problem where in the paper we're really taking a slice out of that problem and solving that problem. So be careful about not getting too broad on your objective statements. Uh, the other thing I would say is make sure your methods and results are actually methods or they're actually results. A lot of times those get mixed together uh, and I think it's important that we clearly separate those. Uh, if you have a long method section, make sure you use uh, subheadings so that you everybody can kind of see the different sections that belong in the methods. And then what I like to do is really to see if there's a subheading, and sub subheading or a subsection in the methods, there's also one that also follows uh, very closely in the results. Okay. 
uh, spend a lot of time looking at your tables and figures. Uh, the, you know, the picture can say a thousand words or 10,000 words or a million words. Uh, spending some time on tables and figures, making sure they're clear and very polished is very, very important. Um, you know, good tables and good figures are, are extremely valuable. And I would highly, highly recommend that you spend as much time as you can possibly spend uh, really putting together tables and figures that, that really convey the information that you want to convey. If there's information in a table that you're not really going to use and it's not really important, you don't need to include it. And I think that's something that students a lot of times struggle with is they've done all this really great work as part of a thesis or a dissertation. They want to shove it all into this paper, but it's really not important for the story. It's really, you don't really need to necessarily include it uh, as part of that table or that figure. Uh, make sure that in your work, as you get to the conclusion section and the end of your paper, really, you need to really, really focus on the idea that you really need to have some impactful conclusions in there. Tell us really what is the impact of this work, the impact of the research on the scientific and engineering community. Uh, a lot of times people like to write conclusion statements that sound more like summary sections, uh, and they never really tell you what the impact is. Uh, and so be, be, be uh, cognizant of that fact that you really need to, you really need to, you really need to demonstrate the impact. You're the best person to potentially tell the, the story of that impact, uh, tell that story. Uh, and then one of the kind of the things that's uh, maybe a little bit tedious, but make sure references are consistent with the text. Uh, all journals are going to have some kind of a guide for authors. Make sure you're following those as much as you possibly can. Uh, it just helps everybody if the reference list is consistent with the text. Um, any reference that you use or in the text is, is, is in your reference list. Um, you know, back and forth. Just check that list to make sure that, you, again, you're using the correct format. So let me, let me move on just real quick and talk a little bit uh, more about kind of the process that happens as you submit an article. Uh, and so I'm going to specifically talk about the ASAB journals, uh, although this process is, is really pretty consistent among all the journals that you might submit to. Um, so the first step is once you've decided on a journal and you've used all those factors that you're considering, and again, hopefully ASAB journals are, are, are right at the top of that list. As you get ready to submit your manuscript, you're going to have to pro you will log into an electronic system. Uh, we use Scholar One, and what you need to be prepared with is, is to have your title and your abstract, your keywords, uh, contact information. It's very important that you confirm that all authors have approved the final version of the manuscript that's to be submitted. Um, that's part of, the, of um, a very important part of research ethics is to make sure that all the authors have approved of the submission of that of that uh, journal article. Um, and then you're also going to need to suggest reviewers for your paper. One of the things that I would I would highly suggest that you do um, is again not try to game the system in terms of who you're suggesting to review your paper. Personally for me, I like to suggest reviewers that I know are going to give me a, a real high quality review. Because my point is, and my take, is that if they're not reviewing my paper at the review stage, they're going to be reading it later after publication when I don't get a chance to do any updates to that paper. And so I like to suggest reviewers um, that I feel like are, are near the top of my field. Um, you know, some people will talk about, well, the sweet spot are kind of those mid-career people uh, that still are, are uh, very active in the in the field. I think you just simply have to look for people that are going to give you a good review and again are going to help you to improve your contribution. I would not shy away necessarily from people that you really feel like are appropriate to review that manuscript independent of, of where they are in their in their career. So what's going to happen then is once you submit that article, the journal is going to get the paper. It's going to be reviewed by the editorial staff, uh, the, by the editorial uh, board. Uh, it'll be assigned a manuscript number, something like that might be on the screen there. Uh, note that everything is going to go through a plagiarism check. So there's automatic software that's used to look at how similar articles are to other articles. Um, and if you don't follow the submission guidelines, um, the article can just be sent right back to you. Uh, one of the things about the ASABE journals is the ASABE journals actually have a template that you can use where you can put your article into this template. Um, a template, I will tell you, some of the community editors have said, well, the template's not necessarily required. 
but it's really good to use the template because what it does is reviewers actually really like it because reviewers actually see those articles being put in kind of a similar format. They know how the tables are gonna be formatted. They know how the figures are gonna be formatted uh, and they know what to expect. And so I would, I would encourage you to make sure that you're following along and using the template on the, for the ASAB journals um, that's easily accessible on the, on the website. So if you get past that step, and hopefully you do because you follow all the guidelines, you've got everything looks good, uh, then it's gonna be assigned to what is referred to as a community editor in ASABE. So we commonly refer to that as a CE. Now the CE is gonna review the manuscript, make sure it fits with the scope of the journal. The CE is somebody that's within that technical community. So in the, it could be the natural resources and environmental systems, or it could be machine systems. Um, it could be the information technology uh, and systems uh, community. Uh, and so, but they're gonna review that manuscript. Now the time frame on that's gonna be roughly about three to seven days for them to review it, assess it, look at your abstract, look through the paper to make sure that it fits uh, and to really do a little bit of an initial uh, justification uh, that that manuscript does belong in the journal. The manuscript can be rejected immediately by the community editor. That happens actually, uh, um, uh, it's a frequent occurrence. Uh, it may be just simply that the article doesn't fit. It could be that uh, the community editor doesn't feel like it's got enough novelty to the paper. Uh, many, many other journals, this is kind of the barrier step to getting in those journals. You've published in articles, you know, I've, I've published and submitted articles in, in journals like the Environmental Science and Technology, some of the American Chemical Society journals, you know, Nature, Nature Climate Change, those type of, of journals. They, a lot of those are immediately rejected at this level of step three. If you get past step three, because you've got, again, ASAB journals is kind of, it's the right place to be. The manuscript gets assigned to an associate editor. The associate editor is gonna review the paper and can do a number of different things with it. They can reject the paper. Uh, not really, they can't really individually reject. They can actually submit a recommendation back to the CE that it's rejected. And then the CE can decide, well, maybe I, maybe I don't agree with this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna submit this to a different associate editor. Or they may agree and say, oh yeah, you're right and then they may reject the paper. Um, some associate editors can send the paper back to the authors for revisions before sending it out for peer review. So I've seen that happen before. Uh, or they can just move forward with selecting reviewers. Uh, and in general, uh, they're gonna typically select reviewers. They'll try to select three to four reviewers. Um, typically, they will try to do one or two from your suggested list, uh, but not necessarily. A lot of times we see papers where um, the authors have suggested, you know, three suggested reviewers and they're from their same institution, okay? There's no way that those, any of those reviewers are gonna be suggested. And what you're saying to the associate editor is basically, well, you're gonna get to select the three or four reviewers in this case. If you do a good job or you're selecting high quality reviewers to as suggested reviewers, you're probably gonna have one or two of those that the associate editor is probably gonna use. This time frame tends to be about two weeks. That's the goal in ASAB journals is that for these uh, reviewers to be selected in 14 days. But this is where the process can get to be a little bit of a delay, especially again, if we don't have good, highly qualified reviewers that are, are recommended as reviewers within that pool. Uh, where do associate editors find reviewers from? The other place they're gonna look for are your references. Uh, and so it's always important that if you're publishing the ASAB journals, one of the things you may want to consider is, um, you know, are there papers that need to be referenced from the journal uh, that kind of demonstrates who those people are that are within this field and working in that field that would be good, highly qualified reviewers. Um, the manuscript is then going to go through the peer review process. This usually is going to be three reviewers. You could have, very rare that you would have one reviewer uh, more likely it's somewhere between two and four. You could have five. Um, it just kind of depends on how the selection process worked. Um, uh, there's different systems that are used within these manuscript uh, tracking systems where uh, you can actually invite five people and all of a sudden all five people agree. And by the way, five people are reviewing the paper. Usually it's three reviewers though. Um, again, you want the best people reviewing your work. Uh, again, the AEs are probably gonna look for reviewers and, from the papers that you cite. Um, and 
Uh, finding reviewers is the most difficult part of this process. There are just so many journals now, so much pressure on everybody to do reviews. Um, you know, it can it can really be can really be difficult. Uh, and there are some very aggressive journals that will say, you know, you need to review this in seven days. Um, and you know, I've never felt comfortable reviewing an article in seven days. When I agree to review articles, what I like to do is read it let it sit there and then I'll come back to it a week later and read it again and start looking again. And, you know, when I agree to review an article again, I'm making an, uh, I'm agreeing to actually help the contribution of that article. So that's important for me to be able to make a, that contribution in some way. Uh, so review times are gonna vary. Uh, for ASAB journals, we tend to give reviewers 28 days, but delays can occur and they, they, they occur uh, frequently. Um, we are working with the associate editors now to kind of look into those reviews into a little bit more detail and to move forward with potentially just two high quality reviews, especially if they agree. Now, so you may see articles that just have two reviews back. You may see again, three or four, just depending on how things go. Uh, one of the things as an author, I would highly suggest that you do and I do is, is keep track of the status of your manuscript through the online system. You should be able to tell, Scholar One is very good about telling whether the article is submitted, whether it's with an editor, whether it's under review. And I tend to use a three month rule. This may be a little bit out of date relative to kind of the new world of publishing, you know, but I tend to give the journal 90 days. And if in 90 days I haven't heard anything, you know, I'll just check in with the editor or the associate editor. Um, one of my roles as editor in chief is to make sure that all these articles are moving forward. You're welcome to reach out to me and I can give you a little bit of insight, even without having to worry about looking or contacting an associate editor or community editor, just to kind of give you an idea of what the status of your paper is. Um, and so, but, but I wouldn't do that, you know, don't do that a week after you submit the a paper, right? So, so let the process take time. And again, if you've done the steps that we talked about before, you're gonna help where this process is gonna go fast. You know, in cases where I've written a good article, I knew the good reviewers to suggest, I knew I had referenced the right people. Uh, you know, you can get papers back fairly quickly within, you know, within a month and, 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 and really feel like there was a good review process. Uh, once the reviews come back, the reviews are gonna be compiled. The AE or the associate editor will then make a recommendation. They can recommend in the ASAB journals to decline, major revisions, minor revisions, or to accept as is. And so they will compile all of these reviews together and then make that recommendation. That recommendation is then gonna be forwarded to the community editor. And the community editor is the one that actually makes that decision. The decision then gets forwarded to the corresponding author. Uh, if the decision is a reject, uh, then what I would highly suggest that you do is consider how you could make corrections and then think about whether it would be possible to submit to that same journal or a different journal. And whether you can submit back to that same journal or you need to go to a different journal is really a function of what the comments are. If the comments are, this is outside the scope of the journal, there's just no novelty here, you're gonna have a hard time addressing those and getting it into the same journal. But if you've got comments that, well, this needs more analysis or the statistics are very weak and there's a lot more statistical analysis that needs to be applied or you need to reanalyze this using kind of a little bit of a different approach or or include an additional mechanism into the process. Those types of things could then be addressed and then resubmitted back to that journal. Um, and if you're allowed to make revisions, then we continue on. And part of that re revision process is that you need to respond to reviewer comments. And what's very important that you do is that you need to address each of the reviewer comments in what is referred to as a reviewer or as a, re a response document, which is basically a point by point response letter or a point by point response document that outlines every comment and how you either address that comment or if you disagree with a comment, what was the rationale for why you didn't make the change, okay? And what's really helpful here is you wanna make it as easy as possible on the associate editors and the community editor. So what you wanna do is you wanna be specific regarding what change was made, what page number, what line numbers, if you can do that, you will actually help them out a lot. And as you help them do their job easier, your paper is probably gonna move through the review process a lot, a, a lot, a lot faster. Uh, I always try to use a very positive tone. 
I always try to get to a point where I, again, I'm focused on the fact that this is improving my contribution in some way. So I'll give you an example. So this was a comment from one of, from a paper that we published uh, several years ago in the ASAB journals, right? So I always use this in my response documents. I always use this uh, abbreviation of RC for reviewer comment and then AR for author's response. And I put that at the top so everybody knows. But this was a comment that, you know, well, you didn't, you didn't give credit to the right people. Okay? Whether I, you know, whether, you know, whether I agree specifically with this, you know, one of the wrong ways to do this is just to say, well, we're not friends with those authors, and so we don't want to drive their citations up, so we left them out, right? Yeah, it's the wrong approach, right? So a good approach is really to say, uh, yeah, this was this was the papers that were listed. Uh, we put the findings in there. Here's where they're cited. Here's the page number. Here's the line number. And for me, as a if I'm a community editor or if I'm an associate editor, when I see this, I can go right back to that point in the document. I can look and say, okay, this comment, they put the time in and the effort and the energy into addressing this comment in the right way. So you're going to resubmit the revised manuscript. My goal is that I tend to do this. I tend to try to have a personal goal to submit within two weeks and definitely no more than a month. And I like to do that because I like to do it in this for this reason. I don't like to give it a lot of time between the time when the reviewer saw it or the editor's associate editor saw it and when they're going to see it again. I like to keep it a little bit fresher in their mind. Um, some of the times you get a manuscript and you just got so many review comments, you got so much stuff going on at work and things like that, that it takes a month. But I try to, I try to limit myself to two weeks. And so I try to resubmit things pretty fast. Now I don't resubmit things in a day. If you resubmit things in a day, you, you, you run the chance again of, you didn't take many of these comments maybe as seriously as you should. You're going to submit the revised manuscript through the online system. You will submit the original, the new version of the manuscript, probably attract versions of the manuscript, and your response to reviewers' documents. So have that all ready to go. The manuscript is then going to get sent back to the associate editor. And again, this is where the process can become a little bit of a cycle depending on kind of what the state of the, of the manuscript is. So the associate editor will review the changes. If things were minor, the associate editor, uh, she or he may make the decision just to move forward and we're not, we don't need to go back out to reviewers. If the changes were more serious, the paper may be sent out to reviewers. Um, and again, it really kind of depends on how things go, right? We want to get another opinion on this paper. We'll, Almost all cases, things get sent back to those original reviewers. There may be a case where all of the original reviewers are now saying, I simply don't have time to look at this thing again. I hope that's not the case. And if you agree to review a paper, I would encourage you to make sure you're reviewing that paper all the way through the process. Um, but so it could be sent to new reviewers. And that's an unfortunate situation, but something that could happen. So this process could become uh, uh, cyclic. It could become a cycle and may require additional revisions and resubmissions. Um, eventually, hopefully, your article will eventually be published. Uh, all articles now are appearing online pretty much right away. Your article is going to get assigned a DOI. Uh, here's, for example, a screenshot from transactions of ASAB for the in-press accepted papers. Um, your journal is going to be typeset and the, uh, the editorial board will send you proofs. Um, and one of the things I would note at the proof stage is don't be afraid to make changes. You can't make significant changes. You can't rewrite the whole paper. Uh, but if there are small changes, you need, to, you need to be aware of that because after you send back that proof, no more changes can be made. The other thing that I would strongly encourage you to do and I would strongly encourage you to think about is there are differences in publication in publication staffs and in the publication companies with regard to how much effort they put in to editing your proof and making your article sound as good as it can possibly sound. ASAB journals do an unbelievable job. The staff at ASAB headquarters spends a lot of time going through each and every article. There are a lot of journals that don't do that, okay? And I have published in some here, I will admit even recently, where it seems like, you know, two day, a day after I published to get the article accepted, they're sending me a proof which means they haven't looked at your article at all. You don't have any additional set of eyes on your article. And again, I'm an engineer, I'm not a technical writer. I, would, I appreciate the opportunity to have somebody looking at that article again. And then the last step in the whole process is once you get the proofs done, once you get everything done, 
you need to celebrate. Um, you know, I've published a, a little bit more than I think 130 articles now, and every time I get an article accepted, uh, it feels very good. And so you should take the time to, to celebrate that, that accomplishment. So that's really all I have for how to navigate the publication process.